financial institutions are now under the microscopes of regulatory authorities more than they've ever been before. Whether it's data and reporting, stress testing and risk management, or the treatment of customers, regulators are increasingly more focused on compliance. And the onus is on the banks themselves to ensure they're both responding and, more importantly, adapting to these evolving market conditions. Anti-money laundering in particular is an area that financial institutions have been heavily criticised for. Now this is by governments as well as regulators themselves for what they perceive to be weak controls on the part of the banks. However, the big question is, can banks really find that balance between reaching compliance and still adopting and maintaining a customer-centric approach to their overall AML processes? We talked to Phil Rolfe, Head of AML Services at Royal Bank of Scotland, as well as Micah Wilbrand, Global Director of AML Marketing at Financial Crime Specialists Nice Actimize, about the importance of people, processes and technology, and the need to create what is in effect a culture of compliance within the bank itself in order to really help the financial services industry continue adapting to this ever-evolving AML challenge. It's evolved significantly over the last decade. Uh, when, when I first started uh, in financial services and in the AML space, uh, really it was in its infancy. Uh, we really focused on customer onboarding and just basic identity verification and sanctions. So when you're going to go to a financial organization, you provide your name, your address, your postcode, and your date of birth, and then that would be verified against electronic databases held by credit bureaus or the electoral register um, and those types of databases. And then it really focused on um, sanctions checking, ensuring that you're not working with sanctioned individuals. The 2000s were really marked post 9-11 on really focusing on uh, the money transfers to sanctioned individuals, uh, specifically Al-Qaeda and other terrorist related organizations. So throughout the decade we saw a lot of emphasis on that and at Actimize uh, we have um, our Suspicious Activity Monitor product which uh, are used in a lot of tier one banks globally to really help drive out that activity. Um, the last five years, though, we've started to see a shift back, probably to where anti-money laundering started in the 1990s, which is really focusing on the relationships. We have a very good handle now on money transfers and where money is flowing, um, but criminal organizations have now shifted back to hiding their activities amongst organizations, and that's where we're seeing a lot of emphasis now. I think in the last 10 to 15 years, we've seen it come along uh, enormously. Uh, it was previously more of an ivory tower back office function. However, with the, the changes in the market in the last few years, it's become much more central, much more critical to banks and organizations, uh, much more centrally led and focused, and much more customer centric as well, which I think is absolutely critical uh, in a market that is so important as financial services globally. With criminals getting even more sophisticated with the techniques they're using to launder money, one question that never fails to go away is whether or not banks are really doing enough to adapt to these evolving threats. Is there enough cross-functional collaboration throughout the enterprise in order to meet this challenge? And do these institutions have the right technology and the right talent to help achieve this? I think as in any market, there are those that are leading, uh, those that are in the pack and are those that are struggling to catch up. The banks have tried to adapt to the changing market conditions. Um, the, unfortunately, the bad guys are constantly changing the way they operate as well and becoming more and more sophisticated. And therefore, the organisations have had to invest in even more uh, complex and sophisticated solutions to try and detect the threats across the organisation. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult and challenging market. Um, but it's non-competitive in the sense that all organisations have to invest in this space uh, to try and improve the safety and security of banking globally. They really have the past three to four years uh, really looked at technology to help them and, and the reason for that is because sanctions have shifted from being broad sanctions. So the West used to just say don't work with Iran don't work with Cuba, don't work with North Korea. And that's really changing. Uh, we saw this uh, with the Ukrainian crisis um, 18 months ago, two years ago now, where the idea of what they call secretarial sanctions came into play. And what we're seeing now with the alleviation of sanctions on Iran, the lifting of US sanctions on Cuba, um, what we're starting to see a shift now, instead of just easily saying, don't send any money to Iran, don't have any trade with Iran. Um, they're really targeting specific individuals, and that's what we saw with the Ukrainian crisis. 
uh, the, the West only sanctioned specific individuals and specific organizations which were critical to the Russian economy. And they felt that doing that would be a better method to help uh, bring, you know, help end the, the Ukrainian crisis. But what we've seen the past couple years is this idea of what they call the culture of compliance. And regulators have really been pushing on this and stating that Compliance for a financial organization is not just the financial intelligence unit, the fraud unit, the, the money laundering unit's job. Everyone within a financial organization has a responsibility to ensure that the organization is compliant with money laundering regulations. So that is really a top-down approach from the CEO all the way down to the branch teller, that they need to have an eye on, on every transaction they do, every relationship they build, every touch point, that there's an idea behind compliance. And we are starting to see those effects coming through. Cross-functional collaboration is absolutely critical. Um, the bank has a set of um, a single policy to which it operates uh, and all franchises and divisions run to that policy. Um, so that helps us with consistency. We've also got training that's shared across the organisation from very basic training that we will all do to far more complex training um, that the people who are on the front line of our AML and sanctions businesses will undertake. And that drives understanding a common language and we hope improves collaboration as well. From uh, an individual perspective, uh, the biggest challenge they have is actually training a financial analyst. There are a lot of regulations that have come into effect recently and ensuring that analysts know how they're supposed to adhere to specific regulations and, and deal with that has been a real full-time kind of effort. And with the incredible ramp up and, and the acquisition of talent within the anti-money laundering space, it's been, a, it's been a real challenge. There's not a lot of highly skilled anti-money laundering people. Ten years ago this role didn't really even exist. With the masses of data banks have on all their customers around the world, a major issue for them that still remains is exactly how accurate or up to date that data actually is. The biggest obstacle uh, to compliance in this space would be around data quality. So we are large organizations that have millions of customers globally. Um, gathering and maintaining that data over time and keeping it current is a challenge for any institution. So what we're seeing from an IT perspective is really breaking down the, those technology barriers um, and allowing them to see across the enterprise. And the technology has evolved and, and at Nice Actimize we've been working very diligently to um, having our technology enable the financial organization to break down those technical walls. So they can share information throughout the organization um, and really have an enterprise view. Uh, of what these, uh, what their customers and entities are doing within the organization. We are investing in systems and processes to uh, gather and maintain the data on our customers so that they can transact with us globally. Um, we are always evolving our systems and processes to try and spot the bad guys within the 99.99% .99 of our customers who are good. You can't set the bar so high that it's impossible to do business uh, with us and that's a, a challenge that many of the global banks have. What we're seeing now with the advent of Hadoop and Cassandra and all these other new database type technologies and all this back-end technology that, that we've had developed over the past you know, 10 to 15 years, you're starting to see the influence of the younger IT generation coming through and not being so scared. We can now show in a non-cost prohibitive manner, we can shift all of their data from these old 1950s, 1960s mainframe to these much lower cost, faster performing Hadoop type clusters, which will enable them to, to continue to operate and actually in a much um, cost effective manner. With KYC and customer due diligence playing naturally a pivotal role in the overall AML process, how far can banks actually go when investigating a customer and doing the necessary diligence before they lose that customer? And with every customer being unique, are the current systems being employed by banks flexible enough in order for their KYC and CDD processes to be relevant for each individual? The biggest challenge in relation to KYC and CDD is understanding who is behind an organisation. The ultimate beneficiary and the owner of that organisation are who we're really interested in. Um, you may start trading with one company, but through changes in the background of that organisation, you could end up dealing with somebody else. So there's a real challenge to maintain that data over time so that we know who is our ultimate customer. So at Nice Actimize, what we've done is over the past three to four years, we, we spent a lot of time with our customers really evaluating um, and mapping what their customer due diligence and onboarding processes are. Uh, we knew when the Financial Action Task Force passed their new 40 recommendations in 2012, 
that the regulations were really going to start to build up and be enforced um, in three to four years after that. So what we wanted to do is work with our customers and really evaluate what they were doing and, and how we can turn a lot of these manual processes that they had into automated processes that would make things more efficient. The first was working on our what we call our customer risk assessment engine. Um, so every customer that comes into a financial organization, regardless of who they are, is given a risk rating. The risk rating is based on four different types of information. So the products and services that you take from a bank, so wire transfers, checking accounts, uh, stocks, bonds, and, and those types of activities. Um, it's then based on geography, so where you are, where the bank is, where you're doing business, are you sending money to um, a high-risk geography or not, um, and then you as an individual. So we started to build what we call just uh, these customer risk models. And what these customer risk models focus on is the behavior of the customer and, and how we expect them to act. And so what a financial organization now has is they have a more proactive approach. They're not waiting um, to see if something's coming out. If we're seeing more money flowing through to a high-risk geography or you're seeing more money transfers or there's too much cash. So the example we like to give is Breaking Bad. Um, with Breaking Bad, um, you have a car wash and you're putting money through. Um, normally, it just might look like a very successful car wash, but when you when you pull up the covers and look underneath, you may say this car wash is pulling $10 million a year where every other car wash is pulling $1 million. So you're building some models to tr try and pull out that type of activity that, that would seem suspicious. If you are a customer-centric financial organization, those are the ones that are starting to win the battles going forward. It's not these it's not the bastion of, you know, we kind of hold everything and, and just become completely risk averse. Um, you know, that you're starting to get um, more, more of that customer centric view. And those are the companies that are using technology to do it. Um, they're not depending on hiring 10,000 people to, to look through documentation. It's people that are using technology to, to automate the process better because you, you have to make it more cost effective. And the only way to really do that now is through technology. The only thing restricting the techniques being used for laundering money is the imagination of the criminals themselves. However, with the right people using the right technology, combined with collaboration across different levels of a financial institution, we can not only help ensure that these evolving threats are addressed, but through the right data and behavioral analysis, we can prevent them from actually happening in the first place.